It's been a long time. I hope you are well and all the devotees too in Leicester. Covid's got a second or third wave, right? In the UK? Okay, okay. Anyway, I'm I'm glad that uh, all of the devotees are, whoever had the Covid has recovered and hope and pray that the other devotees will be safe and healthy and in happy Krishna consciousness. Thank you. Happy to be of service to all of you, Pradyumna Prabhu. So shall we begin? Would you like me to do a Jai Radha Madhava also? No, please, please. No, 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 no. No introductions. We'll just... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pradyumna Prabhu, for that generous introduction. I'm really happy to be with all of you. Hare Krishna. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja 
जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय गोपी जन वल्लभ गिरिवर धारी जय गोपी जन वल्लभ गिरिवर धारी यशोदानंदन ब्रज जन रंजन यशोदानंदन ब्रज जन रंजन यमुना तीर वन चारी यमुना तीर वन चारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय ओम विष्णुपाद परमहंस परिव्राज का आचार्य अष्टोत्तर सतहिष डिवाइन ग्रेस अभय चरणारविंद भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी शील प्रभुपाद की जय अनंत कोटि वैष्णव वृंद की जय श्री श्री राधा माधव की जय श्री श्री गौर निताय की जय निताय गौर प्रेमानंदे ऑल ग्लोरीज टू दी असम्बल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू दी असम्बल डिवोटीज All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories, all glories, all glories to Shri Guru and Gauranga. Om Adnyana Timirandha Siddhyana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Kada Mahyam Tadati Svapadantikam वंदे हम श्री गुरु श्री युत पद कमल श्री गुरून वैष्णवांश श्री रूपम सग्रजात सह गण रघुनाथान्वित तम सजीव साइत सवधूत पिजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य श्रीराधाकृष्णपदा सह गण ललिता श्री विशाखान्वता नम ओं विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण प्रेष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर शिवासादि गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जयाद्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जयाद्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जयाद्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा इट इज सो नाइस दैट इन इज कॉन लेस्टर वी हैव दिस सीरीज ऑफ लेक्चर्स गिवन बाय डिफरेंट डिवोटीज on the topic of the well known conversations that shri chaitanya mahaprabhu had with certain very very special devotees 
and specifically in the teachings of Lord Chaitanya there is mention of five and I'm told you've been hearing uh, Mahaprabhu's discussions with other devotees earlier and today we are dis going to discuss Mahaprabhu's conversation with Ramananda Rai. Now it is very difficult to accommodate such uh, an interesting and elaborate discussion uh, in just the span of 45 minutes or so or 40 minutes, 50 minutes even and especially if you want to consider the purports of Srila Prabhupada as well. Uh, but I think still it's a good idea to have a kind of a summary study of the conversations in this time uh, so that everybody can have a kind of a glimpse of what the teachings are and then those who are interested can actually go deeper and further into it. So it's a very good idea to have this series of lectures and I commend uh, Pradyumna Prabhu and the devotees in, in the team there who have decided this. Uh, before we begin the conversation, uh, let me uh, speak a few words about Ramananda Rai first so that we get to appreciate uh, the reasons behind this conversation. By the way, uh, in the community of devotees of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, these famous conversations are either called Samvad or Shiksha. For example, and the teachings to Rupa Goswami are called Rupa Shiksha. To Sanatan Goswami, they are called Sanatan Shiksha. And the conversation between Ramananda Rai and Mahaprabhu is called Rai Ramananda Samvad. Samvad means a conversation or a dialogue. And it's not called Shiksha or teachings for an interesting reason. That normally it is the devotees who inquire from the Lord and gain knowledge and mercy through the instructions that the Lord gives. But in this case, it is the opposite. It is the Lord who inquires from the devotee. And the devotee then actually proceeds to um, shower the nectar of the jewels of Krishna conscious conclusions. Now, uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami has compared Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to an ocean of transcendental uh, knowledge. And he has compared Ramananda Rai uh, to a cloud that has drawn up some water from that ocean and then proceeds to shower a rain uh, into that very ocean meaning that it is only by Mahaprabhu's mercy that Ramananda Rai has been infused internally with all the uh, conclusions of ecstatic devotional service in the mode of Vrindavan. So Ramananda Rai has become by Mahaprabhu's mercy a repository or a storehouse of such uh, devotional conclusions and he's also in the words of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, an Adhikari Rasika Bhakta. Adhikari means one who is very qualified or eligible. Rasika indicates one who is able to relish the higher rasas or the transcendental mellows of ecstatic devotional service. And Bhakta means a devotee. So, no individual who has such an intimate dealing with the Supreme Lord can be an ordinary devotee. And especially if we consider that the Lord has actually used that devotee as an instrument to broadcast to the world very, very confidential uh, instructions and information about uh, transcendental uh, spontaneous devotional service. Ramananda Rai uh, is a very intimate associate of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He is considered amongst the three and a half most intimate associates of Mahaprabhu. Um, and it is said by Bhaktivinoda Thakur that Ramananda Rai is actually Vishakha Sakhi in Vrindavan. So Vishakha has manifested in Gaur Leela 
as Ramananda Rai is actually the combination of several personalities including uh, Arjuniya Gopi, um, Arjuna who has appeared in Braja Leela as Arjuniya Gopi. So anyway, that is his identity in uh, the spiritual world, in Vrindavan. So uh, he was born in Alalanath and he was from a, a community that was not considered very spiritually elevated, not from a so called unquote Brahmin family. Uh, he later became a governor of the province that is today called Andhra, Andhra Pradesh, um, which was under King Prataparudra of Nilachal or Odisha. Now, uh, he um, was very learned in the scriptures. He was a great devotee as well. Uh, when uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya heard that Mahaprabhu was planning to go from Jagannath Puri to South India on a pilgrimage tour, he offered him some gifts of some clothing and also made a special request that he should go to Vidyanagar, which was in the banks of the Godavari, and meet Ramananda Rai there, <clears throat> who was a government officer, the governor there. And he requested Mahaprabhu to not think Ramananda Rai to be an ordinary person because of his quote-unquote not-so-high birth. But actually, uh, he is the only one who is really eligible to uh, get the personal association of Mahaprabhu. <clears throat> it is only he who is fit for your association, Sar uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya told him. No one compares to him in knowledge of rasa, transcendental mellow. And when you actually converse with him, you will realize his exalted uh, knowledge, his devotional status. And uh, Sarvabhoma makes a confession he says, initially when I met him, even I did not realize his greatness. It is only later by your mercy that I have understood how great Ramananda Rai is. <clears throat> so, uh, Ramananda Rai therefore is a very, very special personality. And uh, Mahaprabhu uh, had this dialogue or conversation with him uh, on the banks of the Godavari. <clears throat> When Mahaprabhu set out from Jagannath Puri towards South India, he more or less walked along the coast. He came to the place called Kurmakshetra or Kurmasthan, which has a famous ancient temple of Lord Kurma, the tortoise incarnation of the Lord. And then he went further down to Simhachalam, which has the famous uh, ancient deity of Jira Narasimha. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> then he went further on down south, he came to uh, Vidyanagar, he crossed the uh, Godavari river by boat, he reached the other side and he sat there. <clears throat> and at that time, Raman of the Rai, who came there with a retinue of, of uh, soldiers and ministers and, and priests also accompanying him. And when he saw this most effulgent sannyasi standing or sitting there, he was uh, very captivated and he approached him and offered obeisances. Mahaprabhu asked him for his introduction and he said he was just a fallen person. Mahaprabhu understood this was Ramananda Rai. He embraced him and the two of them developed ecstatic symptoms. And the onlookers there were struck with wonder to see this. Uh, Eventually, the two of them controlled themselves and then decided to meet the next day at the same place for uh, further conversations <clears throat> on Krishna. Of course, at that place, they both glorified each other. <clears throat> so we won't go into the details of that. But suffice it to say that um, Ramananda Rai was eagerly looking forward to associating with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu the next day. And they met. Uh, Mahaprabhu was greatly eager <clears throat> to glorify Ramananda Rai. 
How is that? Because he wanted uh, Ramanand Rai to become an instrument to reveal these very confidential and deep conclusions of rasa tattva, of the goal of life. <clears throat> it is the Lord who wants to give credit to the devotee for everything. The Lord wants to glorify the devotees in as much as the devotees want to glorify the Lord. So there is a kind of a transcendental competition between the Lord and the devotee in glorifying each other. <clears throat> So, in any case, um, Mahaprabhu's first question to uh, Ramananda Rai as they sat down comfortably was, Paro Shloka Sadhira Nirnaya. Now, I won't be able to narrate too many shlokas because of the paucity of time, but perhaps just a couple of important ones I might just mention in the passing. Otherwise, I'll mostly just go ahead and make it a descriptive class. Uh, because we have to accommodate uh, many topics. <clears throat> so, sadhya refers to the goal. Nirnay refers to the ascertainment. So, Mahaprabhu's question is, Pado Shloka Sadhya Nirnaya, which means, please recite a verse that will uh, ascertain, give us the ascertainment of the goal of life. And Rai's reply, reply was, Swadharma acharane Vishnu Bhakti Hoy. <clears throat> that just by discharging one's occupational duty according to Varnashrama Dharma, automatically one can uh, become, make one's life perfect. He quoted a verse from the Vishnu Puran, Varnashrama Acharvata Purushe Naparha Puman, Vishnu Raradhyate Pantha Nanyat Tattosha Karanam, which means by, by Properly performing one's occupation and duties in the Varnashrama Dharma, Lord Vishnu is very pleased and there is no other way <clears throat> that can please Lord Vishnu. So, Varnashrama Dharma of course has been established by the Supreme Lord Himself and He declares this even in the Bhagavad Gita. However, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard this, He says, Eho Bahya Age Koho Ar. Now the word Bahya means external. Age kaho ar means speak, go ahead, speak something more. So it is not that Mahaprabhu <clears throat> rejected the Varnashrama Dharma, but what he intended to say by saying Eho Bahia is that ultimately Varnashrama Dharma is material. It's a material arrangement of the social and spiritual statuses of life within human society. But this arrangement, though required for gradual purification and advancement in spiritual life, is still a material uh, arrangement. <clears throat> so, uh, he was not satisfied. He said, go ahead and speak something more. So then Rai spoke about Krishna Karmarpana. Krishna karpa, Karmarpana Sarva Sadhya Sar. So the essence of Sadhya or perfection is to arpana, to offer karma, one's activities to Krishna. So, Krishna, karma, arpana. <clears throat> so, offering the results of one's activities to Krishna. So, this is a little better because here, you're not simply performing your occupational duties, but when you do your occupational duties, you are taking the fruits of those activities and then offering them to Krishna. So, you go one step further. And he quoted the Bhagavad Gita Shlok, Yat Karoshi, Yad Dashnasi, etc. In which Krishna says that whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer in sacrifice, whatever you give away in charity, whatever austerities you perform, you do it as an offering unto me. <clears throat> so Mahaprabhu was still not happy with this. Uh, he says, Eho Bahi Age Kaho Ar. This also is external. What is it that he found external? So, even though there is karma palatyag, there is the renunciation or the offering of the fruits of one's karma to Krishna, still inherently the activities are material. So, therefore, Mahaprabhu wanted to go a little higher. So, Mahapra, so Ramananda Rai replied at that stage, Swadharma tyag e sadhya sar. <clears throat> so, the essence of perfection is. Svadharma Tyag. 
to give up one's uh, occupational duties according to Varnashrama Dharma. So Karma Tyag, the earlier was Karma Phala Tyag, to give up the uh, fruits of one's activities for Krishna. And here it is not Karma Phala Tyag, but Karma Tyag, that means to renounce one's very, the activities themselves. So, uh, and basically to give up your occupational duties, uh, essentially indicates taking of sannyas or the renounced order. <clears throat> and um, uh, Ramanand Rai quoted the famous Bhagavad Gita verse, Sarva Dharman Parityajya Mame Kam Sharanam Vraja. So when Mahaprabhu heard this, he considered it, but still says, Eho Bahia Adi Kaho Ar. This is still external. Why is it external? Because uh, one is still not engaged in spiritual activities. Merely taking sannyas or doing karma sannyas as a formality, as, as a routine, is, is not going to take one very far. It may perhaps get one eventually by very stiff renunciation and austerity to a point where one may negate, uh, you know, uh, material life, but uh, even that to some to, to a large degree will not be possible in this. But it is still not uh, devotion because he had not come to the point of actual devotional service to the Lord. Mahaprabhu was not satisfied. So uh, after Swadharma Tyag, then Mahaprabhu says, Eho bahi kaho ar. and at that time, Rai Ramananda says. Jnana Mishra Bhakti Sadhyasar. So it now comes to the point of bhakti and says that bhakti which is devoid of any type of mental speculation. Because you see on the path of sannyas, uh, traditionally, conventionally, not Vaishnava sannyas, but uh, the other forms of sannyas, karma sannyas, there is involvement in either uh, austerities or some uh, speculative activities and so on. So uh, here, but there is no tinge of devotion. So now Ramananda Rai is saying that let there be some speculative knowledge, but it should be done in connection with devotional service to the Supreme Lord. And uh, at that time he quotes the verse again from the Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma Nashochiti Nakangshiti in which Krishna says in the 18th chapter that one, when one is situated on the platform of the soul, on the spiritual platform, then actually one can begin devotion to the Supreme Lord because bhakti is a devotional activity. So this is the path of jnana mishra bhakti. Mishra means mixed. So that devotion which is based on philosophy and logic in the words of Srila Prabhupada. That uh, devotion which is mixed with some kind of speculative uh, endeavors. So, um, Mahaprabhu is still not satisfied with this. And he says, Eho bahir agi kaho ar. Because when one takes to the path of, of mental speculation, of philosophical speculation, Na iti, na iti, not this, not this, not this. You try to negate the material. But then negation of the material is not necessarily the attainment of the spiritual. By mere negation of the material, one may come to an intermediate neutral platform, but one may not have access to the positive uh, elements of the spiritual platform. So Mahaprabhu didn't approve of this uh, kind of an impersonal speculative process. So he said, Aage kaho, uh, Eho bahia Aage kaho ar. And then um, Ramananda Rai said, Jnana Shunya Bhakti Sadhyasar. So that uh, the, the essence of devotion of, of life, of the perfection of life, is to have. Uh, bhakti or devotion which is devoid of mental speculation. So that is a very important point. And 
basically in the so far even in the previous one in Jnana Mishra Bhakti uh, there is no trace of any attempt to revive one's eternal relationship with the Lord in love. Uh, whereas here in Jnana Shunya Bhakti, Bhakti that is very much there. So then he, he um, uh, Ramananda Rai spoke this very famous verse of Brahma from the Srimad Bhagavatam Yane prayasamudapasi namantya eva jivanti san mukharitam bhavadiya vartam sthane sthita shudikatam tanuvan manopir ye prayaso jitajitopyasita istri lokyam. In which uh, Brahma says that for one who gives up this speculative mentality, this jnana mishra type of a mentality, and uh, engages in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord in whatever stage of life one may be in, sthane sthita, and one offers obeisances to the Lord, one uh, hears and chants about the Lord uh, and tries to develop uh, the eternal relationship that one has with the Lord, then that is uh, very important. Uh, so that is the essential goal of life. Now what Ramananda Rai has said here is very important because in this verse, Jnane Prayas Samudha Eva, Brahma is speaking about the importance of uh, hearing and chanting about Krishna, reciting his messages and chanting his holy names, etc. Now, for the first time upon hearing this, instead of saying Eho Bahia, it is external, Mahaprabhu says Eho Hoy that yes, I agree, this is true. So Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport that Srila Prabhupada uh, uh, mentions that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepts this process of hearing and chanting about the Lord as the basic principle of perfection. So perfection can begin not unless one has taken to the association of devotees and accepted the process of hearing and chanting wholeheartedly. Of course, the devotees must be bona fide devotees. They must not be devotees whose devotion is mixed with speculative philosophy or with fruitive activity, etc. So, this is the, a turning point in the discussion. Because now, Mahaprabhu has said that let us proceed from this point on of the process of hearing and chanting. So Mahaprabhu is happy, but he still says, there is a lot more, Aage kaho ar, go on, speak more. And Ramananda Rai says, Prema Bhakti Sarva Sadhya Sar. So the idea that one should hear and chant about the Lord is very important, it is very nice, but uh, at the same time it is ordinary devotional service. And when that ordinary devotional service uh, um, is performed sincerely and regularly, then it can mature into ecstatic devotional service. So one has to go through the process, Srila Prabhupada explains, of sadhana bhakti. Sadhana is a stage of practice and sadhya is a stage of perfection. Remember, the question that Mahaprabhu has asked is about sadhya, about perfection. So sadhana is the stage where one practices devotional service. One has not become perfect. So in the initial stage, one practices devotional service out of some faith and out of obedience to the instructions of the spiritual master and the Vaishnavas and the scriptures. And as one makes advancement, one's devotion becomes deeper and it becomes more spontaneously executed. So then, this process of ecstatic love of God is called a rag marg. Marg means a path. Rag means uh, intense attachment. So devotion that is, or devotional service that is rendered out of, spontaneously out of intense attachment to the Supreme Lord, uh, that comes under rag marg. And this is 
typically exemplified by the uh, devotees of Rindavan. So now having mentioned Prema Bhakti, now this is, uh, so further talks between uh, Mahaprabhu and Ramananda Rai are going to be based on the platform of spontaneous li- uh, devotional service. Now, in this stage of Raga Marga, uh, service to Krishna is rendered out of greed. In the earlier part of Sadhana Bhakti, where there is Vaidhi Bhakti and Raganuga Bhakti, especially in Vaidhi Bhakti, one's devotion is rendered out of obedience and faith. In Raganuga Bhakti, uh, there is obedience, uh, but it is done more spontaneously. One acquires a lot of taste for serving. There is a very natural inclination to serve. And as that natural inclination deepens and progresses, and one reaches ultimately the stage of uh, serving Krishna out of total greed. So it is based on this a platform of spontaneous love, which is Prema Bhakti, that the discussion further continues. Now, um, Ramananda Rai then goes on to explain, because Mahaprabhu keeps asking, keeps egging him on, keeps saying more, 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 eho hoi, age koho ar, eho hoi. So all the time now, instead of saying eho baya, he says eho hoi. But continue, go higher, higher, higher. So having come to the platform of Prema Bhakti or pure spontaneous love for the Supreme Lord, when he asks him to go higher, now he starts talking about the rasas. So when love of Godhead is elevated to the personal platform, then uh, it is called Prema Bhakti. And in the beginning of Prema Bhakti, there is no particular relationship between the uh, devotee and the Lord. This is how Srila Prabhupada explains it in the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. But as the devotee continues, a relationship with the Lord develops and is manifested in different flavors. So, uh, now Ramananda Rai starts outlining these different flavors or rasas or mellows. So as the relationship with Krishna increases in affection, the mood of fear and consciousness of the superiority of the Lord that existed previously now diminishes. Even on the platform of pure love, um, there is a spirit of considering the Lord to be the master and oneself to be uh, subordinate. So in this way, uh, where the more one progresses, one even transcends that uh, feeling of the Lord being superior and one being subordinate. Uh, then one comes to the uh, Sakhiras. So from Prema Bhakti, um, Ramananda Rai came to the platform of Dasyara, so the uh, service to the Lord in the mood of, um, of a servant. So in Dasyaras, there is a clear distinction. There is proper appreciation of the greatness of the Lord, but a spirit of personal service has strongly manifested, which doesn't exist in the earlier stages of devotion. And now uh, the devotee uh, can serve as a servant, but further on, uh, there is a development of the uh, sakyaras or the feeling of considering the Lord as one's friend. In dasiras, there is a feeling that the Lord is superior and I am the subordinate. But in the mood of fraternity or friendship or sakyaras, the devotee feels I am equal to the Lord. I am the Lord's friend. And in this way, there is a kind of sense of equality and therefore we see that the cowherd boys in Vrindavan they play with Krishna, they eat together with him in the forest, they frolic together, they have many many wonderful pastimes together. 
when the affection and fraternal de uh, devotion that is sakyaras increases even more it develops into what is called the paternal relationship which means vatsalyaras wherein uh, the devotee considers himself or herself as a parent of Krishna. At each stage, of course, um, Ramananda Rai gives evidence from the scripture. He cites some verses, but I am not citing them in order to save time. So, uh, when he comes to Sakya or to Vatsalyaras, uh, he explains further uh, about, he gives some examples uh, about the uh, devotion of Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj and their good fortune. So in the ordinary devotional service, uh, there is a neutrality. Uh, the sense of service has not developed that much. In the mood of Dasya, there is a mood of being subordinate. In the mood of Sakya, there is a mood of being equal and in the mood of, in the mellow of Vatsalya, of the paternal Ras, actually the devotee feels superior to Krishna. Superior in the sense that he or she feels that Krishna is dependent on me. Krishna is my son or my, my dependent and I must take care of him. And if I don't take care of him, then Krishna will... Some harm may come to Krishna. He may fall sick, or he may uh, do some, commit some mistake that will cause harm to himself. So the devotee becomes protective about Krishna, even though Krishna is the ultimate protector for everyone. This is because of the deepening of the affection, and further. Um, as one goes higher and higher, deeper and deeper, then one comes to the platform of conjugal rasa, madhuri rasa, in which uh, there is complete intimacy. There is no inhibition at all. So all the way through, uh, having speak about, now the Ramananda Rai speaks of kanta prem. Kanta prem means the conjugal mood. So Srila Prabhupada explains that Ramananda Rai has moved from um, the ordinary conception of the Supreme Personality of Godhead to the conception of master and servant. And when this becomes confidential, it develops into a friendly relationship. And from a friendly relationship, it develops further and becomes paternal. And when it develops to the highest point of love, it is known as conjugal love. And to illustrate the uh, conjugal love, he gives the example of the rasa dance and how um, the gopis were fortunate to participate in the rasa leela but even the goddess of fortune uh, did not have that opportunity did not have that fortune so uh, Srila Prabhupada also mentions here Ramananda Rai actually quotes and says that Spiritual affection for the Lord is transcendental in all cases, but the individual devotee has a specific aptitude for a particular relationship, and that relationship is more relishable for him than others. Meaning that it is not that every devotee who takes to this path uh, will naturally progress onwards to the conjugal mood. In some cases it may happen, in some cases the devotee's natural mood may be at Dasyaras or at Sakya or Vatsalya. And because that devotee's inherent spiritual aptitude is for that uh, type of service or relationship with Krishna, so he or she would be completely satisfied in that mood. So in this way, um, um, Ramananda Rai speaks about Rasa Tattva and he also gives the example of how uh, the different Mahabhutas you know earth, water, fire, air, ether just as they manifest progressively one after the other and in the process they also yield the Tanmatras which is the sound, touch, form, taste and smell and of the material elements, five material elements 
it is ether which is the most subtle and earth which is the least subtle and beginning from um, ether which has a certain quality which is sound and then going on to air fire water ether there is an addition progressively of one quality each time one tan matra one sense is added and eventually earth which is the grossest of them all has the qualities associated with all the previous elements and plus it has an extra quality so similarly uh, each rasa has the qualities uh, that are found in the previous rasas but also it has a quality that is not found in the previous rasas so ultimately the conjugal ras has the qualities of the previous rasas but also something special something extraordinary that does not exist in the other rasas so ramananda rai also distinguishes uh, between here tattva and rasa now uh, prabhupada explains it i'm just summarizing how shri prabhupada explains it that uh, while krishna whether in uh, vaikuntha as a four armed narayan or in dwarka as rukmini raman or in krishna as radha raman is the same so lakshmi pati in vaikuntha rukmini raman in dwarka and radha raman in vrindavan are all the same one personality krishna so in tattva in truth in principle they are the same personality but yet there is a difference between them and that difference is one of rasa of mellow because the way that the lord deals with his devotees in these three different places is different there is a spirit of awe and reverence uh, with which the devotees in vaikuntha deal with the lord and that is substantially diminished in dwarka there is much more sweetness in the relationship but when it comes to vrindavan uh, there is uh, a perfection of sweetness unlimited sweetness that exists there so the intimacy that exists between krishna and his devotees in vrindavan is unparalleled therefore prabhupada explains that even though there is a oneness in terms of tattva or or truth but one cannot equate lakshmipati with uh, rukmini raman and uh, radha raman so this is called rasa bhas or the fault of overlapping tastes or mellows because a devotee cannot deal uh, in vrindavan in the same mood that he deals with the lord in vaikuntha or vice versa so uh, this is an important point that is made here so there is ordinary devotional service there is devotional service in vaikuntha devotional service in dwarka and devotional service in vrindavan so there is a kind of hierarchy so after describing the glory of the relationship between um, the gopis and krishna lord chaitanya asked ramanand rai to go even further and ramanand rai remarked that this was the first time he had to, he had been asked to go further than the gopis in an attempt to understand krishna because he says i don't i i can't think of anything that is higher but nevertheless since you are asking me you are the puppeteer Uh, i am an stringed instrument and you're just vibrating the strings and i'm speaking whatever you wish me to speak this has been the mood of ramanand rai all through this uh, conversation so then um, the idea is that mahaprabhu wants him to come up from ordinary conjugal love uh, which is exemplified in vrindavan especially by the gopis conjugal love exists in dwarka and in vaikuntha but of a slightly different mellow as i just mentioned but in vrindavan it is the gopis now even though the gopis are so special but mahaprabhu wants him to go even further and wants him to come to the point of shrimati radharani that's the whole idea so uh, it is explained that one who wants to 
uh, understand the relationship between Radharani and, uh, and Krishna in conjugal love, uh, that relationship is the most perfect. Uh, so one has to follow in the footsteps of the damsels of Raja in order to be able to understand this most transcendental relationship. And then Ramananda Rai begins glorifying Srimati Radharani. That she is the only gopi who is so dear to Krishna that even when all the other gopis are present, if Radharani is not there, then Krishna is not satisfied. And he gives certain verses in which uh, Krishna actually leaves the company of the gopis when Srimati Radharani is not there. And then he speaks about the Rasa dance in which Krishna expanded himself uh, and accompanied each gopi. But Ramananda Rai's conclusion is the perfection of the Rasa dance was con or the Rasa dance was considered to be perfect due to Radharani's presence. And in Radharani's absence, he felt the dance was disrupted. In other words, Krishna could not enjoy a pastimes of the gopis in the absence of Srimati Radharani. Now, so having established uh, the position and the glory of Srimati Radharani, Mahaprabhu wants him to go even further. At this point, Srila Prabhupada also gives an indication of how Mahaprabhu, through this dialogue, is actually sending out a message to the world that Mahaprabhu was a sannyasi. He was born in an aristocratic, very learned, pure Brahmana family. And Ramananda Rai was not born in a Brahmana family. He was born in a, a community that was in those days considered at a lower level. Yet, Mahaprabhu thought Ramananda Rai a fit candidate to be like his guru in the sense that he asked him questions. And he, he got Ramananda Rai to answer all these questions. So Srila Prabhupada says the lesson to learn from here is that one should not think in terms of a guru uh, materially. It doesn't matter what the birth uh, or the background of a personality is. If one knows the science of Krishna, uh, one is eligible to teach others about Krishna and one should unhesitatingly accept such a person as Krishna. And Prabhupada gives two examples here. One is of Sri Rasikananda, who accepted Shamananda as his guru. And also of Ganga Narayan Chakravarti, who accepted Narutam Das Thakur as his guru. So Ganga Narayan Chakravarti was also from a Brahmana community and Narutam Das Thakur was not. But Narutam Das Thakur was so exalted that Ganga Narayan Chakravarti happily accepted him as his guru. So this is an interesting uh, and important message that um, Prabhupada mentions here. He also speaks about the Kama Gayatri Mantra, wherein he says that uh, actually when um, Krishna plays the flute, as is mentioned in the Brahma Samhita, then that enters into uh, the creator Brahma's ear as the Omkar, Om, and then it comes out of Brahma's mouth as the Gayatri Mantra, and specifically the Kam Gayatri Mantra. So, uh, then Brahma attained all Vedic knowledge through this Gayatri Mantra. Uh, also, there is some description of the beauty of uh, Krishna, and also of the spiritual energies of Krishna, and that Srimati Radharani is the spiritual person the personification of the internal bliss potency of Krishna, as is indicated also in the Brahma Samhita. So when the Ladini Shakti is further condensed, it is called Mahabhava. And Srimati Radharani is the personification of that Mahabhava. So uh, he Ramananda Rai goes on to explain in very esoteric terms. Uh, the glories of Radharani, the kind of transcendental emotions that she experiences, her unique position, the matchless qualities of Srimati Radharani, 
which are incomparable. Even the queens of uh, Dwarka and others uh, uh, do not have these qualities. He also uh, speaks about how one should try to understand the love of Radha and Krishna. And finally, he, he speaks about entering the confidential pastimes of Radha and Krishna. That we can do that only in, by following in the footsteps of the gopis of Vrindavan. So, um, he speaks about the Sakhis and the Manjaris and so on. He glorifies the gopis as being not of this world. He speaks about the spiritual bodies that they all have, spiritual bodies, the relationship between the gopis and Krishna, Radharani and Krishna is not to be considered an ordinary material relationship. And in conclusion, um, Ramananda Rai answers uh, what one would in today's uh, time call rapid fire questions. You know, one by one, quick questions, quick answers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the first question he asks is, uh, what is the highest standard of education? And Ramananda Rai reply, replies, the knowledge of the science of Krishna. So, the standard of material education is sense gratification. But uh, Krishna consciousness is different. The highest education is different. The highest education is the knowledge of the science of Krishna. Uh, the second question, what is the greatest reputation one can have? And Ramananda Rai replies that a person reputed to be Krishna conscious should be considered most famous in the world. So being a pure devotee of the Lord is actually true fame, true renown. He gives the examples, uh, Prabhupada gives the examples of the 12 Mahajans. And there are various other uh, aspects that Prabhupada mentions in the purport. The third question, what is the most valuable thing in the world? And Ramananda Rai's reply is, he who has love for Radha Krishna possesses the most valuable jewel and the greatest riches. So this this has to be distinguished from the material conception of wealth, where one considers wealth in terms of uh, the money of this world or gold and diamonds or property or assets and such things. But these are all perishable items and they don't have lasting value. But what is of true value is love for Radha Krishna, which is the greatest jewel one can possess. And therefore, one who has this is the wealthiest person in the world. The next question that Mahaprabhu asks Ramananda Rai is, what is the most painful existence? And interestingly, Ramananda Rai replies that separation from a pure devotee constitutes the most painful existence. A devotee is of course very rare, extremely rare, a pure devotee. And the pure devotee is endowed with such exceptionally um, attractive qualities that to be separated from such a pure devotee is extremely painful. So Ramananda Rai brings it up. So again, one can contrast these answers by the material answers that people would give in this world. A material answer for the most painful existence would be, let us say, to be deprived of one's wealth, to be deprived of one's reputation, uh, to be blasphemed in the world, uh, to lose one's body. You know, so these could be considered very painful from the point of view of the world. But from a Krishna conscious point of view, Ramananda Rai says, to be separated from pure devotees is the most painful thing. And then he asks, which is the best song of all? Ramananda Rai replies, that any song that describes the pastimes of Radha and Krishna is the best song. Not any songs that uh, glorify, uh, you know, all the relationships of this world and events of this world. Next question, what is the most profitable thing in the world? It is the association of devotees. What should a person think of the pastimes of Krishna? What is the best type of meditation? 
meditation on the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. Where should a person live giving up all other pleasures? The answer is Vrindavan. Uddhava, according to Uddhava, it is the best place to live even if one has to live as a plant or a creeper. Of course, physically it may not be possible for uh, most people to go to Vrindavan and live, but Mahaprabhu's and Prabhupada's instruction to us is that to make our heart Vrindavan and to make the place we reside in, wherever it may be on the globe, Vrindavan, by having uh, hearing and chanting of the names and forms and pastimes, etc. of the Lord and being engaged in devotional service. What is the best subject to hear of? The pastimes of Radha and Krishna are the best subject to hear of. Who is the most worshipable deity? The transcendental couple Radha Krishna should be the ultimate object of worship. What is the fate of those who are after material happiness and after liberation from material bondage? Ramananda Rai's answer is, some turn into trees and attain heavenly planets where they enjoy material happiness, ultimately. <laughs> so in other words, whatever degree of material happiness and position one may receive in the material world in any planet, ultimately that's going to be our destination. So after the rapid fire questions and answers, Ramananda Rai speak, distinguishes the cuckoo from the crow. The uh, crows are those who don't have any taste. The crow-like people are those who don't have taste in uh, devotional matters. Just as the crow prefers eating the bitter nimba fruit uh, instead of some sweet fruit. Similarly, materialistic people would rather relish uh, tasting materialistic topics uh, rather than uh, relishing um, transcendental topics of Radha and Krishna, which are like uh, the seeds of a mango. So after this, um, Ramananda Rai requested the Lord not to hide himself any longer. Because right at the beginning uh, of the conversation, actually, when they met first time, um, Ramananda Rai had told him that by Akriti and Prakriti, I can understand that you are the Supreme Lord. Akriti means the appearance and the features, and Prakriti means the behavior. So I can understand from your appearance and from your behavior that you are none other than the Supreme Lord, because such extraordinary transcendental qualities cannot exist in a human being. So now uh, Ramananda Rai requests Mahaprabhu to not hide his form any longer. And then being pleased, Mahaprabhu actually reveals his form as the combined form of Radharani and Sri Krishna. Upon seeing this, Ramananda Rai faints. And uh, because he has understood the purpose of this incarnation. So uh, Ramananda Rai was extremely fortunate. He could not bear uh, that sight. Having seen it, he fell to the ground unconscious. So, in this way, these talks, Srila Prabhupada explains, uh, were on the highest level of love and Krishna, or love of Krishna. Some of them, the topics that were described, that were discussed between the two great personalities have been mentioned by Kaviraj Goswami, but most of the talks could not be described. So, uh, they, these topics are like gold. So if one is uh, eager to attain the higher understanding of Krishna consciousness, of life in general, one should study this conversation between um, Ramananda Rai and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Finally, Ramananda Rai concludes by thanking the Lord and saying that he had never thought that he would be able to speak on this subject matter. So, but the Lord had taught him this, just that he had formally taught the Vedas to Brahma from within. So ultimately, Mahaprabhu is the teacher 
he has taught the student but from within and then he has made the student to teach him the teacher so this is the extraordinary discussion uh, it is not easy to find even in devotional literature even in the vedic scriptures discussions of this caliber and of this kind of depth so we are very fortunate that Srila Prabhupada has made available uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita that Srila Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami has actually compiled this and that Sri Mahap Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has descended here to give us uh, this ultimate knowledge. Thank you very much. So I think we'll stop here. I'm sorry I'm a few minutes over time. So should we have um, questions? Yes, that's an interesting question. You see, uh, I was mentioning this in um, another class the other day to the students of VIHE, where I was speaking on the subject of envy, two lectures on envy. And uh, somebody asked a similar question, and I was explaining that um, Spiritual, because the material world is a perverted reflection of the spiritual world, so the uh, qualities that are found here are also perverted reflections of the qualities found originally in the spiritual world. So therefore, anger here is compassion actually originally. You know, so greed is, is satisfaction and so on. So envy is appreciation, etc. At the same time, these qualities do exist, uh, but in their completely spiritualized form. For example, we may see Radharani getting angry with Krishna, right? So there is anger, but it is completely transcendental. We may see that there is some transcendental envy that happens between the two groups of gopis. You know, Champaklat, I mean, I beg your pardon, uh, Chandravali's uh, camp and Srimati Radharani's camp. Right, But we must keep in mind that even though we use terms like envy, uh, actually these are situated on the platform of the purest of pure transcendental love. Chandravali is also an expansion of Radharani. So uh, these symptoms of apparent envy are not to be compared to the envy as we find it here in the material world. And they are meant to uh, further nourish and enhance the taste of the pastimes in Vrindavan. So we can see this from two points of view. These qualities exist in terms of their opposites in the spiritual world and they also exist as they are but in completely purified form like envy but the envy of Chandravali or the envy of the gopis and so on. So, uh, that is how we can see it. I think Sundar Madhava Prabhu has asked a question here. Um, is Madhurya Ras understanding something exclusive to Gaudiya Vaishnavism or do the other Sampradayas also speak on this? It is, well, the other Sampradayas do, like the Nimbarka Sampradaya does. Um, 
they they definitely speak of the madhurya ras the other sampradayas in even the madhurya sampraday to which the gaudiya sampraday is linked they don't speak so much about it they are more in the mood of vaikuntha and even where the uh, madhurya bhag exists it is uh, between lakshmi and lord narayan so it is an inhibited kind of madhurya uh, not the kind of free flowing uninhibited madhurya ras that is found in vrindavan so uh, similarly in the shri sampradaya we definitely find madhurya bhav for example there was a lady called andal a pure devotee lady she was the son of another pure devotee uh, who was also an alvar she was the daughter of that alvar and uh, so she was in this mood of madhurya she wanted to uh, marry krishna and she wouldn't marry anybody other than krishna so we do find this uh, however the kind of um, depth and uh, shall we say the intensity and the sweetness that we find in the uh, teachings of mahaprabhu and in the gaudiya understanding of it is quite exceptional um nimbarka sampradaya yes in vrindavan you will see many of them they also uh, are uh, very much appreciative of this mood of madhurya Okay, there are many questions here. Okay, in the CC Madhya, it states, uh, Sachi Kumar Prabhu here, that Ramananda Rai's father, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tells Ramananda Rai's father that he's Pandu, his wife is Kunti, and his five sons are the five Pandavas. You also mentioned that Ramananda Rai was an incarnation of Vishakha. In the Shrimad Bhagavatam, Sri La Prabhupad purports that since the Lord is absolute, there is no difference in the transcendental nature of each and every dealing with the Lord. One should not therefore consider that his dealings with the Pandavas are less important than his dealings with the Gopis. My question is: Are the statements in the CC and the SB related because Ramananda Rai is an incarnation, or is it that whatever dealings the Lord has, be it with the Pandavas or the Gopis, or his exchanges? uh exchanges very with the devotees in the different progressive rasas that they are all equally important okay sachi kumar prabhu thank you for this question actually there is something very special in um the gaudi version of understanding of the associates of the lord now we will find many times in the personalities of uh, associates of the lord who manifest themselves especially in gaur leela you will find that there are there is a combination of personalities in one personality uh so for example uh, Ra- um, ramananda rai is vishakha sakhi as explained by bhakti vinod thakur in gaur ganodesh deepika it is also mentioned that ramananda rai uh, some people call him lalita sakhi and others do not but bhakti vinod thakur definitely calls him vishakha sakhi but another interesting point is <clears throat> that ramananda rai is also an incarnation of the pandava arjuna the gopa arjuna and the gopi arjuniya gopi So Arjuna appears in Vraj Leela as Arjuna Gopa and also as Arjuna Gopi. So Arjuna Pandava, Arjuna Gopa, Arjuna Gopi and Vishakha. So they all combined into the personality of Ramananda Rai. So if we we find this kind of astonishing thing happening, it's fairly common place actually if you look at uh the associates of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So I hope uh, that answers your question, Sachi Kumar Prabhu. So yes, all are equally important because the Pandavas also uh, they appear in Vrajalila in in these interesting ways, especially Arjuna. 
and Gaur Leela also, all the Pandavas have come. Ramananda Rai's father was called um, Bhavananda Rai, if I'm not mistaken. And he had five sons. So that is why uh, Mahaprabhu explains that your, your Pandu, your wife is Kunti and these sons are um, the Pandavas. So they have appeared in Gaur Leela. Okay. Okay. So is there a constant evolution in that or is it fixed? Okay. So your question is that when we speak in terms of uh, the affection intensifying and uh, then it moves from one rasa to the next and so on, is it that uh, for a given devotee also that that given devotee moves through these rasas and comes or is it just at one point? No, you see, when that uh, sequence is being spoken about, it is spoken about from an objective point of view, not from a subjective point of view. Uh, what I mean by that is that you, you look objectively at all the different rasas and see uh, the kind of qualities that exist in each rasa. And that's how you make an objective comparison of the two. But when it comes to a given devotee, that devotee will have a certain aptitude, a spiritual aptitude for a particular mellow. And that devotee will be happy only in that mellow. Now these mellows may also exist in a slight, in a slight mixed form as well. Someone may be predominantly in, in one rasa, but may have a little mix of this and a little mix of that rasa. So someone may be predominantly in Sakya Rasa, but may also have a little bit of Vatsalya. For example, Balaram is slightly older. So he has a little mix of Vatsalya in his Rasa for Krishna, which is Sakya. Of course, Balaram serves Krishna all the five Rasas. But as the cowherd boy Balaram, you know, even then he has this Rasa. Similarly, Yudhishthir towards Krishna has Sakya, but some slight Vatsalya because he's a little older. So in any case, uh, each spirit soul has a certain spiritual aptitude for a particular mellow. And uh, that living entity will be happy in that mellow. Uh, Hanuman, for example, understands the glory of the gopis. But Hanuman is satisfied very much by serving uh, Lord Ramachandra. He understands how the gopis are the greatest of all devotees and uh, how sweet and intense their mellow is. But his heart cannot leave Lord Ramachandra's lotus feet. So this is how we can understand this. Okay, so thank you all very much and, and it's really nice that you're having such philosophical topics. Uh, it is so important for all of us to actually absorb ourselves in understanding uh, the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu deeply. Um, and I hope and pray that uh, the activities of Iskon Lester will flourish and grow from strength to strength. So thank you, Pradyumna Prabhu, for inviting me and thank you to all the devotees for your kind and patient attention to this class and for your good questions as well. I hope and pray you all stay safe. Thank you, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.
கௌர் பிரிமானந்தே ஹரே கிருஷ்ணா